Good evening. Uh, my name is Christopher Geisler. I'm the Deputy Director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum, and I am delighted to welcome you this evening on behalf of the Carter Library and the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center to a conversation with Shirley Ann Higuchi, the author of Setsuko's Secret, Heart Mountain and the Legacy of the Japanese American Incarceration and Douglas E. Nelson. Tonight is my pleasure to introduce Douglas E. Nelson, who will be joining our author in conversation. Doug is the retired president and CEO of the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Apologies. Uh, which under his tenure became one of the nation's most influential and respected large foundation. Doug serves as chair of the CDC Foundation and as a member of the board of directors of the Carter Center. He also serves as vice chair of the Heart Mountain Board of Directors and is one of the creative forces behind the new Heart Mountain Institute, which is developing content to spread the word of the incarceration beyond the confines of the former campsite. Doug made his first trip to Wyoming in 1968 as a graduate student at the University of Wyoming, where he first learned about the concentration camp at Heart Mountain, which became the topic of his master's thesis. The thesis became a book, Heart Mountain, the History of an American Concentration Camp, which was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Before turning it over to Doug, just a reminder, you can join in the discussion by putting your questions in the chat and Q&A box, and we'll get to them during the program. And you can purchase a copy of Shirley's book and support their foundation by going to shopheartmountain.org. And with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Doug Nelson. Thank you so much, Chris. I, this is a special uh, delight for me to be able to talk to Shirley uh, uh, about her book and about Heart Mountain and uh, do so under the auspices of the um, Carter Presidential Library, um, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation and uh, the Carter Center are two of the most important organizations that I've had the good fortune to um, get to know and to admire and uh, serve with. So this, this seems like uh, a special gift. I, I should say, uh, um, before we get uh, to the book, um, to remind our audience, uh, if they are not aware of it, that um, uh, the history of the incarceration of Japanese Americans uh, uh, was importantly impacted by Jimmy Carter uh, when he was president. In 1980, it was President Carter who put together a bipartisan commission to address uh, the wartime relocation of Japanese Americans uh, and to do so uh, in a way that was a real reckoning for the country. Uh, that uh, initiative led to the uh, uh, enactment in 1988 of a formal apology and what President Carter called a symbolic compensation for the wrongs done to the Japanese American community during World War II, an unprecedented and courageous acknowledgement uh, of our uh, nation's failure, uh, only a strong nation uh, can do that. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, uh, introduce a, a brief film for everybody that gives a little bit of background and context uh, for um, Shirley's life and uh, her book uh, before we begin uh, our conversation uh, uh, about uh, both of those things. So uh, let me uh, uh, roll that film. I always knew that my parents met as children at a place called Hard Mountain in Wyoming. And my mother, Setsuko, always called it a place of love. It was only after she died, however, that I learned the truth. Hart Mountain was a prison. 14,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated there during World War II for the crime of looking like the enemy. Setsuko's secret is my attempt to understand the lives of my family, myself, in the complicated history of the Japanese American experience. Both sets of my grandparents immigrated from Japan. The Higuchis came first, arriving in 1915 from Saga on the southern island of Kyushu. They started farming in Santa Clara County, California. 
my mother's parents, the Saitos, came in 1918 and in 1923. They lived in San Francisco's Japantown and opened a store. Life in California was hard for Japanese Americans. State law banned immigrants from owning land, and Caucasian neighbors often resented their success. The children of immigrants called the Nisei had to work extra hard to prove they were loyal Americans. Despite hardships, many Japanese Americans found the good life and made their way in society. Some became professionals and owned their own home, and others excelled in college. But then came December 7th, 1941. After Pearl Harbor, wartime hysteria and racism intensified towards Japanese immigrants and Japanese American citizens. They called them spies or saboteurs, despite the lack of evidence. Then on February 19, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which allowed the military to ban Japanese Americans from the West Coast. Census records told the government where to find Japanese Americans. Signs posted in neighborhoods said they had just days to pack and leave. They could only bring what they could carry. My family was issued a duffel bag with their name and number stenciled on the outside. Shikata Ganai, some said, the Japanese term for it can't be helped. There was little resistance. They were first sent to assembly centers, which were temporary concentration camps on converted fairgrounds and racetracks. Some families slept in horse stalls and were forced to live like animals. This lasted a few months. Then the prisoners rode on a darkened train to one of the 10 concentration camps scattered across the U.S. My father remembers peering under the window shades to see where the train was going. My family was sent to Heart Mountain Relocation Center in Wyoming. Many prisoners wept when they saw their new home surrounded by barbed wire and guard towers. Wind and dust swept through the tar paper walls. The barracks had no running water, the bathrooms had no privacy, and the mess hall food was terrible. Summers were sweltering and winters were brutal. The prisoners repeated another term, gaman, which means endure. In spite of this treatment, many incarcerees yearned to serve the country that imprisoned them. They enlisted in the army and fought bravely in Europe and the Pacific. But others stood up for their rights. More than 80 men at Heart Mountain resisted the military draft as long as they were prisoners. They were convicted and sent to federal prison. The rest of the Japanese American community shunned them for decades. My parents and grandparents spent three years behind barbed wire. After the war, they along with many others in the community wanted to put the shame and the rejection behind them. They never talked about it. My generation called the Sansei could not understand why. Only after my mother died did I realize the depth of her commitment to preserving the memory of the incarceration. She inspired me to understand this part of my family's history in my community's experience. Over the last decade, I've been committed to safeguarding against the racism and fear that drove the Japanese American incarceration. It was my mother, Setsuko, and her secret that taught me, and hopefully you, that we can never relax in the fight for justice. Hello again. Uh, it's now my uh, real pleasure to uh, introduce to you the 
uh, principal in this conversation tonight, my friend Shirley Ann Higuchi. And um, Shirley Ann uh, is uh, a distinguished attorney uh, serving um, in a kind of glass ceiling breaking uh, uh, event as the president of the DC Bar Association and working uh, many years as a leader of the American Psychological Association. But for tonight's purposes, uh, her most important title is as chair of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation um, and uh, as um, uh, a good friend of mine. Um, so Shirley, um, welcome. Uh, it's great that we get this chance to talk uh, as we often do about Heart Mountain. Uh, but but I, I'd like to start with a question. The most basic one is for somebody who had not considered themselves a historian uh, or uh, an author, um, what was it that made you decide that this was a book you needed to write? Um, and when did that uh, occur to you? Well, I think uh, it really happened, as you know, after my mother passed away in 2005, that I was invited to a walking tour celebration in her honor. And, um, you know, once I actually arrived at the site, um, the beautiful mountain and heart mountain, the terrain, I think what really captured me at that point was the amount of people you know, both locals in Wyoming, as well as Japanese Americans, and in particular Nisei that were there, um, not honoring my mother alone, but honoring their own experiences and their connections to Heart Mountain it was absolutely overwhelming. And um, as you know, um, you know, I got recruited on the board and I quickly became elevated in 2008 as chair based on your recommendation, which was um, a very interesting experience. But I quickly knew that because I was evolving as a person and learning more about the Japanese American incarceration, I needed to document those experiences because for me, it was a life-changing experience. And I felt that if I could document those experiences and tell the story in the way that I was experiencing it, maybe I could help impact other lives and educate people, influence the way that people look at the um, experience of the incarceration. Shirley, um, why do you think your mother kept what was clearly important to her uh, doing something to memorialize the events uh, of World War II at Heart Mountain? Uh, why, why did she keep that from you? And why prior to that, while you were growing up, did you learn so little about the hardships your mother and father endured during World War II? Well, I think that you've uh, heard the saying about Nisei being the quiet Americans. And I think that uh, in many ways, my parents and my relatives fit that profile. Um, however, I think growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan and not knowing other Japanese Americans, I think I was doubly insulated. And I think that my family was on an accelerated journey to really become assimilated and become a, you know, the best Americans possible. Um, so um, I think part of it was that, like most Nisi, I think that my mother felt she did not want to burden us with that history. Yeah. Um, I think in many ways, um, even though it was a very stressful and traumatizing experience, I think for her, she tried to paint it as a good place or a fun place to be, because after all, that's where she met my father as children. And a lot would have happened if she wasn't incarcerated. I mean, for one, I would have never been born and neither would have my brothers and my parents would have never met. So I think what I've learned in this experience is when something really bad happens, you know, you really can't pick and choose what you want about that experience. You really got to make something of it. And I think what I've learned since that time is that Heart Mountain meant a lot to my mother. It was a very important place to her, even though she couldn't talk about it. And I think just because somebody doesn't talk about something doesn't mean they don't care about it. And it doesn't mean that they weren't affected by it. And that's what I've learned um, through this process. I, I, I knew your mother a little bit uh, when she was uh, being supportive of the uh, foundation in its early days to try to acquire uh, the property at the site and, and to do something. And uh, 
in addition to being an extraordinary person, um, I, f I always found it interesting, uh, especially when I learned your experience growing up, that your mother wanted to protect you from the story of what happened to her. But simultaneously, I think she wanted to contribute to uh, an enterprise that would tell their story to the world. And, uh, and I think she, um, she held those two aspirations together. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I think this is not an uncommon experience among Sansa, the third generation uh, children of people who survived the incarceration, that growing up, they knew very little about what their parents experienced. Um, and it, it took me a long time to understand that since it was a central event in their lives. Um, and, and until at least some people explained to me the obvious, and that is you don't want to convey vulnerability to your children. You don't want to plant some seed of doubt about who they are and where they belong. And so I think this was a, a parenting strategy um, that um, was in, uh, intended really to be as supportive and protective uh, uh, of their children. But it is a very hard thing, as you say, to bury a piece of your history uh, as a, a, a way of trying to protect your children. Um, how, how do you think your mother would feel about um, what you have done since she passed away? Well, that's a, a, that's a really, uh, in many ways, a complicated um, uh, question. I think the biggest question I get a lot is, what would your mother think about this book that really is about her and her life and the way that you viewed her as a child growing up? And I think that's separate from what would your mother think now about the fact that you and Doug Nelson and a team of other directors and staff are running this world-class museum at the site where she was incarcerated, where when she was alive, she dreamt of something being built there. I mean, that's something that our colleagues on our board, the other Nisei, Bacon Sakatani and um, uh, Shig Yabu and others said that my mother did publicly say in some, some of these board meetings that she dreamt of, she wanted something built at that site. And she didn't care whether it was a, um, you know, a gift shop or a memorial or a stand or a museum or whatever. But I think she would be totally shocked today if she saw what we've done there. I mean, what we've done there together, Doug, has been incredible. And sometimes I have to pinch myself and wonder why is it that we were able to achieve all this? And when I went back and, and listened to uh, President Carter's address when we opened up the museum in 2011 about this is going to be a place of significance for futures to come, I'm like, wow. I mean, even President Carter knew that something great was going to happen. And I think we're on that trajectory. So I think she would be totally shocked about the museum not so sure about the book. I think that one is a little bit more complicated because I, I dig pretty deep in terms of um, not only her life, but also my family's life and some tragedies that are hard to talk about. Um, you know, the, I, had a, I have a kind of a different vantage point on the, the secret of Heart Mountain. Uh, when I was a kid and uh, Chris mentioned that I, I wrote my thesis and then a book uh, uh, about Heart Mountain. And um, two things were interesting about that. Um, this was 1976, about 30 years after uh, the camp had closed. And um, talk about a secret. The, what happened to 110,000 Japanese Americans was buried history at the time. Um, there was not another single history of any of these 10 major camps, concentration camps in the country 30 years afterwards. And uh, more than that, and what was moving for me while I was writing that book and, and as I um, left Wyoming in 1970 is at the site where uh, 14,000 people lived during World War II at the site, which was the third largest city in Wyoming, uh, at the site where 
um, uh, an immense amount of suffering occurred and uh, an immense amount of resilience uh, and determination uh, was exhibited. Uh, there was nothing at that place, not a sign, uh, not a building, um, um, nothing. And um, I was a kid then, but a little bit like your mother, uh, I said, this, what happened here was so extraordinary and so important to the country and so um, tragic that someday somebody needed to do something there that would remind people of, of the events that occurred there and the lives that uh, were lived there. Um, and so um, for me, it's also a little bit of coming full circle. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, somebody called me up and said, can you help uh, us get some land and uh, try to put something together? And uh, it's, it's really been one of the fulfillments of my life uh, to you know, sort of come to terms with making this, telling this history or helping to tell this history uh, um, a privilege and an opportunity that, that I have had. Um, what, what for you was hardest about writing the book? And tell me a little bit about going from somebody who was uh, pretty innocent of all of this history uh, into somebody who now is carrying the message and the story uh, for thousands of other people. Uh, uh, that's quite a journey that you've been on. And um, has it been an easy one, a hard one, a mixed one? Uh, I think it's, it was, it's been a very difficult journey. Not, I mean, just even sort of on the nuts and bolts issue of, becoming chair and working closely with you to build this museum, the politics and the uh, conflicts and other issues that naturally arise when you're doing something this grand. But um, I think that in terms of, of the book itself, I do believe the hardest part um, was talking about myself and the impact that it had on me as a Sansei third generation and really coming to grips that when the Nisei didn't talk much and they were doing it in the best interest of their children, trying to pr protect them, it really sort of does leave a hole in your, in your constitution, in, in, your, in yourself. And as a result, it's hard to really fully integrate your entire self into whether it's daily tasks you're using or relationships with people. So I think that filling that hole and really connecting the dots for me, really tying in, I think, why the Nisei kept quiet. What does, uh, what does it mean when your mother who is a Nisei is controlling and, and is concerned about propriety what is it about not having bad manners and always looking you know, like a nice lady that never does certain things? You get told not to do things, but you don't really understand where they're coming from. And, and I, think, um, I think the hardest part was tying together all those stories and the impact that the incarceration not only had on me, but also my siblings and other relatives. And, it, and, and in some ways it brought me a lot of sadness because I felt, that I learned about, th I was sort of misjudging people, I think, in my entire life. And I think when you misjudge people, it's due to be either being shallow or be lacking education. And I think I was very quick to judge people and judge relatives and judge experiences in my life because I didn't really have the analytical tools to really, um, really appreciate the history of many of these people. And one of that group, one of those groups are the resistors that I've talked to you about, because so little has been written about them that it really took time for me to really digest the importance of it. And I think I was really struck um, when I think I mentioned this to you, looking through the war relocation files and in Takashi Hoshizaki's own handwriting, in that perfect handwriting that he still has today, as he is, he's in his 90s, I will fight if you restore my rights. You know, and they had an addendum, my land clearing rights and, you know, all these other, it was a very complete answer in many ways. And I'm thinking, my God, this boy was only 18 years old when he wrote that. And then what happens is that you start feeling like somehow I could have never done that. You know, I could have never been like my parents. 
And I think I've heard other sons say said, I would have never come out whole if I went through that experience. And then I think the challenge for the sense is not to feel guilty because we're not perfect. We can't do what we'll never be able to live up to what the Nisei have done for us. So what we have to do is live our lives fully and to help others and be an example of what not to do. So it's a very complicated history. And I think the Japanese American incarceration experience and the impact on the children is profound. And it takes really rigorous analytical thinking to really come to grips with it. Um, and that's why you see such a, a, a conflict in the Sansei community where you have these very Teflon Sansei that have no affect. And then you have ones that are emotional, crying, you know, wounded, I mean, and affected individuals. Like, I think I told you after my mom died, I cried for five years. And I'm, I'm, and it really, Pat Wolf came up to me, one of her founders for the audience, a local um, woman who was very involved. And she looked at me and she said, surely you'll cry for five years. And after five years, you'll be fine. And she was exactly right. It was literally five years on the nose. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Takashi, uh, who, who is uh, this resistor, former resistor for the audience, is uh, a longtime member of our board. Um, and um, one of the one of the life changing things for me about writing about Heart Mountain was that. Uh, um, to a degree that did not exist in any of the other 10 camps. Heart Mountain was the site of a very um, conscientiously organized uh, uh, resistance to uh, accepting draft orders, uh, which everyone knew uh, was going to be uh, a dead end. Uh, but the point that uh, more than uh, 180 people, uh, young men at Heart Mountain, uh, came together to make the case that if my parents are locked up in a concentration camp, no self-respecting American would uh, go to war unless their rights were restored. That was basically their argument. And it came up against, as you know, uh, a, another set of decisions that lots of young men, and in fact, the majority of the community made, and that was, uh, we are not going to resist. We are going to accept and we are going to volunteer and we are going to uh, spend blood and we are going to die to teach America how wrong they are at accusing us and our community of being disloyal. And if we have to die to make our point, I remember reading the arguments on both sides in the uh, contemporary arguments during during life at the camp and they were bitter arguments and they were articulated arguments um, and I think it was the first time in my life that uh, I concluded that um, two groups of people two group of patriots uh, who have a different interpretation of what their obligations are to the country uh, can both be right and this was a case in which uh, you couldn't um, disrespect either of those positions. And uh, I think that was a piece of confrontation that I grew up uh, quickly uh, over. And um, the, the other thing that I, I think is important is that part of what my book did to a small audience, but which Heart Mountain, the foundation is doing to a large audience, um, is, is lifting up that issue of resistance uh, was a legitimate and principled uh, and respectable position. Because as you know, long uh, after the war, uh, the, the Japanese American community really shunned those who had resisted during the war. And I think we have been, the, and the foundation, part of uh, the movement toward healing and toward a, a, an inclusion and acknowledgement uh, that um, uh, this was a dignified and principled thing to do, and it should not be condemned as it had been for a long time. And you know, one of the great events uh, as as a part of the foundation is when the JCL, which was 
closely associated with those who wanted to uh, prove their loyalty by sacrifice, decided that they would apologize to the resistors for the harsh treatment that they had extended toward them. So there's been healing uh, in, in, uh, since the war. Tell me what, how you feel, not just for yourself, but for others, uh, children of incarcerees, um, what does healing mean? You know, in, in personal terms, I mean, we know healing was advanced tremendously by the uh, redress and reparations and the apology. I mean, there, that had an enormously, uh, I, I think of, and you've seen it, Shirley, Norman Mineta, whenever he tries to talk about receiving the letter, he was one of those, along with Alan Simpson, one of those who was uh, fighting to get this acknowledgement, this apology. But when he got his own letter, uh, all he could do was cry. And, uh, um, but other kinds of healing, uh, you know, how, how do you think the telling of this story has been therapeutic or important uh, healing? Well, um, one of the feedbacks that I've gotten, uh, and I have been involved with Suro for Solidarity that has these healing circles, and I became active in that, um, as well as doing various book events. Um, I think the biggest part is I've gotten a lot of outreach from other Sansei that said my chapter on multi-generational trauma and giving it a name, the Sansei effect has been very helpful to them in a, in a real strong healing process because it's almost like putting a term and identifying a certain behavior or an effect with the term Sansei effect. We actually have an effect. And um, I think the ability to get other Sansei and even Nisei to open up after reading this book, you know, getting the historical background drop, but also understanding how that generational trauma can be passed down generation to generation, I think has, has had a really big impact. I do think the first step was though, when uh, there was the apology and the reparations, um, which Jimmy Carter had a, a hand in facilitating. That was, I think the first time that I think I kind of got a glimpse from my mother and other Nisei that, wow, we were right. We have the protection of the government saying that what they did was wrong and we were right. And I think that began feeding my mother's desire to do something. But I think yeah. the biggest change for her in her healing, I think, is when my father moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, where there were other Japanese Americans like Judge Raymond Uno, Dr. Jeanette Masaka, who are on our advisory council. I think those JAs that were incarcerated with her at Heart Mountain helped bring her along, which then led to her to want to do something at Heart Mountain. So when she, after she passed, that was her gift to me. I think her gift was her secret. I mean, her gift was that I was able to find out later how much Heart Mountain meant to her so that I could deliver that gift to her fully, which was building the museum that she dreamed of. So that was my healing process be, because I think a lot of the Sansei feel a lot of guilt, like we can't live up to our parents' expectations. So how can we help them? They're always helping us, They're always helping us with our studies, paying for us to go to school, making sure that we're well-dressed and well-fed. They don't want anything from us. But I think the one thing that I know that my mother wanted was something being built at Heart Mountain and I think that for me was healing because I felt like I gave something to her after she passed. And I know it sounds very complicated and kind of like psychological, whatever, but it, it took me a little while to kind of bring that all together. But my healing was that I was able, able to do something for the Nisei, that I was able to help other Nisei be made whole by coming to Heart Mound and experiencing our pilgrimages and knowing that we care about them and their stories won't be forgotten. And I think that's the biggest gift of all. You know, uh, that's very moving. I, I, I also think in addition to what it has meant uh, to tell the story honestly and fully and, and, uh, and frankly of what happened to the Japanese American community, important as that has been obviously to Japanese Americans, what happened at Heart Mountain I think has a relevance uh, uh, for 300 million people in this country now. Um, you know, how do you see, um, you know, I, I've 
give a lot of thought to this. And I think it's part of our mission is to extract the lessons of what happened at Heart Mountain and why it happened and use those as a source of uh, wisdom uh, for uh, Americans as they look, cope with their present and their future. H how do you feel about the relevance of this story uh, to non-Japanese Americans or to the country as a whole? Well, I think that uh, the lessons of Heart Mountain and the people that have been involved and historically connected with the Heart Mountain story can be a teaching tool for this nation. And as you know, you and I have been busily working with Dakota Russell, our executive director, to build the Minetta Simpson Institute, honoring the relationship of Norm Minetta and Al Simpson. And a lot of us sort of harken back and think back at that time and say, gee, that was a time when people actually kind of got along. They were able to put their differences aside. And I think Norm and Al could be representative of that. But I think in terms of, I know what we're working on with the Institute is to use the lessons of Heart Mountain as an example of what our government should not do during wartime hysteria, crises, and other catastrophes like COVID, uh, which we're still recovering from, because I think our society tends to regress to the lowest common denominator, I think, when we're stressed. There always has to be a victim. There always has to be somebody to attack, and there always has to be somebody to blame. And I think the reminder of what happened at Heart Mountain in 1942 may serve as a way to prevent and hopefully change the way that people think about um, each other. Um, as we move forward as a nation. You know, there's a, a, a very kind of personal and specific side to this. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think looking closely at the experience of Japanese Americans and what uh, was done to them uh, by the government reveals how powerful and toxic uh, the combination of um, racial stereotyping, racism, and fear, uh, and uh, selfish uh, aspirations to promote uh, one's uh, political power. That combination is what led uh, to the forcible removal of 120,000 people who'd done nothing wrong. And, uh, you know, there is, for all of us, uh, uh, an opportunity to see the, those ingredients in our country and in our lives today, um, racism and uh, stereotyping and anti-Asian uh, um, hostility, um, all of that um, when times are tough, when in the wake of 9-11, there's a group of people who, uh, uh, look like the enemy and uh, there are people, Muslim Americans who look like the Muslim Americans who were associated with this. And that, uh, that was the closest I think we've come to sliding down this same tragic slope. And one of the things I say it's personal is, is our mutual friend and everybody's uh, hero, uh, Norman Mineta, who was serving in the cabinet uh, on 9-11. When, uh, in fact, he was Secretary of Transportation and had a lot to do with getting planes out of the air and other responses, uh, met um, George W. Bush uh, said at that cabinet meeting, whatever we do, we are not going to do what was done to Norm Mineta in World War II. And uh, in a way, that's the most impactful application of a lesson. Um, now, it certainly, um, was guidance for George W. Bush and for the uh, leadership of the country at the time. I think we need to tell this story in as many ways as we possibly can uh, to as many people so that um, we all say the next time we're threatened, the next time we're tempted, uh, we aren't going to do this again. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think that that's um, one of the reasons I think your book is so important. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think um, Heart Mountain is so important. I also think, and to mention to those who don't know, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation is about to launch a, uh, an effort to build a, a major education center uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the historic site that is going to be capable of um, uh, 
bringing teachers and leaders to the site to do uh, to, to really try in the spirit of Alan Simpson and Norman Mineta to foster and promote a bipartisan agreement that there are fundamental rights and values in this country that do not know party, that do not know race, that need to be uh, that need to be uh, honored and affirmed, uh, and uh, we're going to try to use that institute, use the narrative, the story, the facts about the World War II experience of Japanese Americans as a reminder and as a starting point in a discussion that will deepen, uh, hopefully, uh, the bipartisan agreement on uh, uh, what's core to the country's greatness and maintain that bipartisan commitment to human rights and the rule of law uh, and, and civil rights. Um, I, I, I think I'll go back to Jimmy Carter's vision for this commission. Um, it, it was uh, deliberately uh, made up of uh, Republicans and Democrats, people conservative and liberal. Uh, and the fact that they came to a very remarkable conclusion about what needed to be admitted and, uh, and done and apologized, uh, I, I think that spirit has got to be rebuilt so that, uh, you know, at least our core values are common to all of us. And uh, I think Norman and Alan really personify in their relationship and in their public service, um, the ability of all Americans to agree on certain things that are core to our exceptionalism as a country. Um, um, what, what, what in your mind uh, do we have to do in the future and how do you see uh, this vision that you've got, uh, that you've led with of creating a, an additional capacity at uh, Heart Mountain uh, to amplify our audience and to tell the story far and wide about what happened there. How do you see that um, today and why is it important to you? Well, I think, uh, I think we've already started that process. Um, and as you know, um, we've been able to get uh, our second NEH grant and funding to support workshops, bringing in teachers from all over the country. And, um, you know, if we're able to bring in, you know, during the summer, 150 teachers for two weeks, just imagine if they take that curriculum and that educational um, materials back to their schools and they teach three classes a week and they have 30 students. Well, we'll reach tens and thousands of students across the country. So I think that's gonna be a real important endeavor for the Mineta Simpson Institute. I really wanna dig into, as you know, the, um, the best practices for our government again, you know, what should communities, government officials, you know, elected officials do and what are the best practices that we can emulate? You know, maybe looking at the top five decisions Norm Mineta or Al Simpson had to make that really benefited the community and what kind of processes went through during that, that, that experience. Um, I also believe it's really important uh, to have a very strong connection with the Japanese government in Japan, and we've done that as well. And the reason why is because they want to know, they want to know what happened to the Issei and their kinsmen during World War II. They know they had a hand in what happened, you know, after bombing Pearl Harbor, and that they had a role in terms of, you know, ultimately leading to the incarceration of their kin kinsmen. So I think it's important to bring them along as well to see how they can, you know, contribute to this effort. And we just learned that a group of my father's doctoral students that he educated from Japan that are now there are um, actually going to republish um, my book in Japanese and going to make it widely available in Japan, which I think is a really big coup because um, you know many of the Japanese, as you know, don't, don't they don't speak or read English very well. So this this will really have a major impact, I think. Um, yeah. But I think it's going to be education and education, education, and using the power of place in the side of Heart Mound to be that teaching tool. And I think that, you know, Doug, this is going to be, you know, our legacy where our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren could feel proud that what we participated in 
uh, to help tell the story. And I think I think it's it's something that's going to be incredibly important. And I think all our board members feel that way, and all our family members feel that way. And I, I feel really proud to to work on this next leg of our journey. And I, I'm really excited about it. I, I I couldn't agree more. I I I think that uh, we've probably got some questions in, in the queue. It's a uh, I we've had a chance to talk a little uh, a lot. Uh, I wonder if there are folks that uh, want to pose some questions. We do have a, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. It's it's actually uh, incredibly resonant with this moment now, it seems to me too. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for being able to participate in this. We have uh, a few questions and uh, yeah, please add any that you may have. Um, one of them at a time when state governments and school boards are trying to eliminate education of uh, events that may upset people, is there a lesson to be learned by incarceration? Well, Doug, why don't you take that one? <laughs> well, uh, let, let me give that a try. I feel so, sort of strongly about this. I, you know, the, uh, the, the, the formula for uh, repeating a mistake is a, a deliberate attempt uh, not, to, uh, uh, not to confront uh, the truth and the facts and the history. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to oversimplify a complicated debate, but, um, just in the way that the history of what happened uh, uh, during World War II, the Japanese Americans was for a quarter of a century uh, buried for all intents and purposes and not made a, uh, a national, a subject of national reckoning at all uh, until the uh, much later. Um, I think a resistance to, you know, critical race theory or, uh, is, is clearly an effort to um, steer uh, our knowledge of the past away from the full picture of uh, our past. And while that is uh, uh, done by many in the name of patriotism, I think it is the most insecure, unpatriotic uh, view of America that it cannot tell the truth about its history. In fact, the greatness of this country and the meaning of freedom, I think, is the ability of a nation uh, uh, to look at its history honestly and to learn from it. Uh, and so I think that this um, resistance, this management of uh, information about the past uh, is not a healthy thing and uh, is, uh, is dangerous uh, and racist. That's the way I think it is. Uh, that's, um, there's a lot about silences and quiet, uh, quiet Americans, uh, Shirley said, and that's, uh, you know, it's a, it, there's, there are obviously different kinds of silence, right? Um, and uh, that's a, it's a very um, difficult area to navigate, I guess. But um, it, uh, I, I'm curious, Shirley, about um, the, generational trauma and how that kind of um, has come into the discourse specifically about this and how you feel it relates to, I mean, it seems to me that it's an avenue for connection across kind of, um, uh, I don't um, uh, I don't know, state crimes. I, <laughs> I don't know what else to, to call it. Um, does that, do you have, uh, it sounded like it's been a very powerful tool within the community. Um, I, I'm curious if it's also potentially a powerful tool for teaching outside of the community. Well, I, I, I do hope it will become a powerful tool for teaching because I think looking at the science and the societal and psychological effects of what happens to children when they're incarcerated is a very important area to examine. And I, I think that um, there are many lessons of incarceration that we have to look at to present day experiences. Separation of families are happening today. Incarcerating children are happening today. The way we treat our children, um, the way the children are, are treated period, 
Um, my parents were only, you know, 10 or 11 years old when they were put into that prison camp for three years. And being a child growing up and going through adolescence behind barbed wire has to have a profound effect. Um, I think that, you know, the tragedies that happened at Heart Mountain, I think there were two things that get me really angry about Heart Mountain is, um, and there are things that I actually feel positive about Heart Mountain, so don't get me wrong, but just the, 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 the fact that when those boys turned 18, that they had to make a life and death decision about whether they should volunteer and fight and, or you know, willingly be drafted. I mean, we're now learning that brains aren't even fully developed until age 26. And to for, force a child to make that decision, I think is just heartbreaking. And many of those young boys died you know, in that battle. And, and that had a profound effect on, on their families and the mothers and the siblings in particular. We hear a lot of stories about that. And the same thing about resistance. I mean, I think that, you know, the resistors, their DNA was, you know, permanently transformed when they had to go through that tragedy, that they were not only being shunned by their families in their own community, but by their government. And then they're forced to go to federal prison and they're shunned once they're released from federal prison and exonerated uh, by the government. I mean, that stuff sticks with you. That stuff doesn't go away. I mean, that, that stuff really changes your life. And I hope as we dig into those experiences of, of what happened to the families and the young people during that period and try to bring it fast forward to present day, again, that could be used as a, as a tool. And I've gotten a lot of outreach from many different communities that have read my book and have learned more about Heart Mountain who are affected by this because it reminds them of what happened to their own communities across the board. And we all have that in common, you know, we're all the same. Um, when it comes to being affected by incarceration, trauma, and tragedy, we all are the same. We're affected the same way. Um, that actually uh, dovetails with two questions. One of which is, was uh, the experience, did your parents, because they were children, um, experience it differently than their parents? And what did they have different impacts um, owing to their being quite young? Um, and then the other is about, did learning about Heart Mountain change your views of what America stands for? And, and I suppose also what it, it means to be a citizen of this country. Well, I do think, and we could dig in this more, I, we need more research in this area. I do believe that the age of when you were incarcerated did have an effect of how you handled it. Mm -hmm. I think the ones that got it the worst were the ones that were already in high school and changing, turning 18, uh, while they were in, incarcerated. I think both for, for women, for girls and boys, I think it was bad because uh, you remember too much. And I know that um, when I look at my relatives, I know that the older siblings got it worse, um, even by a couple of years older, you know, because they're more aware of what, what their surroundings are. Um, so I, I think that's something that we could definitely look at. Um, I think the reason why the Issei coped so well, I mean, it's again, it's very complicated. You can't sort of overgeneralize this. You gotta remember a lot of them didn't speak English. A lot of them were immigrants. They came here because they wanted to be here and they were already in many ways suffering and very challenged in the United States. They weren't allowed to own land. They weren't able to become citizens. They came in with the attitude that this is gonna be really, really, really bad. And so I think that the, at least in my grandparents' case, they went along with it. They didn't resist, but I think it became really difficult for their children who were older, the ones that were 16, 17 and 18, who knew fundamentally that what was happening was wrong. And that's what we really learned by looking at the war relocation files of many of the young men is they knew what was happening was wrong. Um, in terms of you know, how it affected me in terms of um, uh, what it means to be an American and kind of the way I view this country, I think it made my views stronger and more supportive and more in wanting to engage. And really, um, I wanna use experiences of what happened to my parents and other Niseis and let them know that their sacrifices, whether as a resistor or as somebody who volunteered for the war or had to stay behind and become incarcerated, none of that is gonna be forgotten because we're gonna memorialize their experiences and use that for good. And it makes me even prouder to be an American. It makes me even prouder of this country 
not because of what happened in 1942, but what has happened since then. And as Doug mentioned, the apology and George Bush's reflection on September 11th, as well as Jimmy Carter's support in supporting um, the reparation and the apology that the commission that, that he signed the bill for. So it makes me hopeful. Um, it, it makes me sad that we're so far behind, but it makes me hopeful. Uh, well, that speaking of hope, um, we have a question from a Japanese studies scholar in Beirut. Um, being specialized in Japanese studies, I wrote an academic study about this tragedy. My concern is, does this history repeat itself? In your uh, opinions, could this tragedy happen to American citizens from Arab and Islamic origins? Well, I think, I think Doug sort of spoke about that, that yes, in fact, it could happen again. History will always repeats itself. And Doug, I don't know if you have any observations about well, that. You mentioned I, September 11th. Yeah, I, 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 I think there's, there are no guarantees. The freedom uh, is not guaranteed and it will not uh, endure being abused. Uh, but I do think that's what is so important about uh, coming to an honest reckoning about our past so we don't repeat it. And it is not simply limited to the uh, incarceration uh, of, of Japanese Americans. There is lots of oppression in our past, which uh, uh, we have to a considerable extent begun to, to recognize and acknowledge and reckon with. And if we do, it is possible that this will not happen again, even when circumstances are threatening uh, that kind of uh, fearful reaction uh, uh, and, and um, ethnocentric reactions to challenges. That's, that's the real mission of this foundation. That's the mission of this Mineta Simpson Institute is to use at least this example as uh, effectively as we can to say, we once incarcerated 120,000 innocent people, babies through 90 year olds. We, we did it when there wasn't a single real genuine reason to believe that they represented a danger to the country. Now, if you've done that, you ought to pause before you start to uh, generalize about the threat represented by other groups of people who at a particular time may be the objects of fear or hatred. Um, so I, 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 I hope, um, the professor hears that the studying this sort of stuff will strengthen America's ability to live, uh, to, to reveal its better self. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I also think there's a, a, a piece of this story that uh, we touched upon the children there. Um, when I was a kid, which is what I was when I wrote the book about this, I, I understood uh, young men, and I, uh, I mean, I understood what that meant. What I've learned now that I'm not a young person uh, is the, the horrible tragedy that the parents of these, the grandparents of uh, Shirley's endured. I mean, they endured with resignation uh, and with uh, a kind of quiet dignity, but the horror of it, when I think about my own life, they lost their identity. They lost their uh, life's work. They lost uh, uh, everything they'd accumulated. They lost their reputations. And maybe hardest of all, when they went from the Japanese American culture on the West Coast to the concentration camp culture, they lost their role in the family. They were no longer the decision makers, the protectors, the insurers, the providers, uh, and you know, one of the saddest things is that before the war, Japanese American families ate together. During the concentration camp, all the kids ate one place and the older folks ate another. That was a kind of symbol of the damage done to that, uh, to that generation and, and to the integrity of the Japanese American culture, which I think Shirley's book is a kind of reweaving of that uh, really healthiness in that culture as a result of this disruption, uh, uh, really the discarding of a generation uh, uh, 
uh, of um, Japanese uh, residents of this country. Um, so it's a way of also not underestimating the fact that people survived this, the fact that there was a no death camps here uh, um, is, not, is not an indicator that there wasn't horrible, horrible suffering. Some of it epitomized when the camps closed and the older generation went back to their lives to find their lives gone, their farms gone, their business gone, their home gone, uh, and who could find, in one instance at Heart Mountain, made a decision to commit suicide because suicide was allowed in his life insurance policy. And that was the only way left for him to try to make a contribution to his children. That's how painful this uh, and horrible this episode was. Um, and it's important to remember that too. We're just at an hour um, or just past. If it's all right with you too, I'd like to ask just, there's one more question from the Facebook audience. That's about what Heart Mountain I think can do and where, where it is headed. And it's, it's um, uh, the question is, um, is from an, a Jewish American um, uh, person who's uh, experienced the intergenerational trauma of the Holocaust. And um, they ask if perhaps um, the media and arts portrayals could be used to address um, the intergenerational trauma. And do you think that more accurate and meaningful art and artistic productions will follow as Heart Mountain expands and as people become aware of this history? I, I, I believe that's one area that we, we are very interested in in making films, um, really looking to the art, also bringing in the younger generation and the diverse communities. I recently did an event with Alvin Hayashi, who is um, a gay Japanese American man whose mother was incarcerated. And he too had three brothers. And I too had three brothers. One, one of his brothers committed suicide and one of my brothers um, died under very mysterious circumstances that I coined the Sansei effect. So um, I really told this gay Japanese American um, fellow writer, I said, you and I are actually the same. We have a lot in common. I'm a girl, you're a gay boy, and we have three brothers and we had a brother that died tragically. So, you know, I think that's an area that that's really worth exploring and, and connecting to. But I do think the multi-generational trauma and trauma in our communities, and let's not forget about the Native Americans, the Crow Indians that lived on this land before Heart Mountain became Heart Mountain incarceration camp. So we're gonna be honoring the Crow Nation and the Native Americans at our Institute as well and make them part of our teacher uh, trainings. That's great, that's remarkable. Um, all right, so we're a little bit over. I wanna thank you both. Uh, this has been uh, just an incredibly informative uh, conversation and I'm uh, grateful for your time. Um, if uh, folks want to learn more about uh, the Heart Mountain incarcerations, they can do so at heartmountain.org. And Shirley's book is available for purchase there as well. If you missed any part of tonight's program, it'll be posted on the uh, Carter Library Facebook page and I believe also the Heart Mountain Facebook page. Um, and you can find updates on our programs at jimmycarterlibrary.gov. Carter Library so uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. It was, uh, it was a fascinating conversation. Thank you and thank the Carter Library for inviting us. Thanks very much. Thank you.